2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 1 Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Every epistle that Paul ever wrote starts with his name at the beginning. This was written around 65, 66 AD. In fact, all of the books in the New Testament were written pre-70 AD, pre the destruction of the Jewish temple, except the book of Revelation. Paul says from chapter 1 verse 1 that he was an apostle by the will of Christ. He was called, he was ordained, he was commissioned by Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 9. The early church did not choose him, they did not ordain him, they did not commission him. He was called by the Lord, he was saved by the Lord, and he was sent by the Lord. From verse 2, he says that Timothy is his dearly beloved son. Timothy was not his biological son, and we know that because in Acts chapter 16, we find that Timothy had a Greek father that was not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, Timothy is referred to as his beloved son in the sense of being his spiritual son. Paul was about 65, 70 years old by this stage, and Timothy was quite possibly in his early to mid-30s. One thing you can be absolutely sure of was that Paul was never addressed as Holy Father, or Your Eminence, or Your Grace, or Reverence, or Professor, or Doctor, or any of those man-made titles. In fact, to call somebody who is not your father, Father, is prohibited. To call somebody Rabbi is also prohibited, because we have one Rabbi, who is Christ, of course, and we have one Father, who is holy, and he, of course, is God the Father, which is in heaven. Paul was quite happy to be called an elder, a bond servant, and a minister. So you need to be mindful of this whole problem with titles, because it can very easily and very quickly result in a two-tier system. The clergy on the one hand, and the laity on the other hand. Referred to in Revelation as the Nicolaitans, and God hates it, God detests it. When Jesus came, he did not call any of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or any of the scholars or the brains that were. He called ordinary men, for the most part fishermen. Jesus was not ordained by the high priest. He was ordained by John the Baptist, an ordinary man who lived out in the wilderness. The Old Testament system was abolished. It was fulfilled in Christ. We now live under the new covenant. We are all equal in the eyes of the Lord. We are a priesthood of believers. And when a typical local assembly meet for fellowship, those within the fellowship will know who the leaders are. They are recognized from within. And the Holy Spirit, of course, will raise up those godly men from within. And they are ordained. They are commissioned to teach and to preach and to feed the local congregation. But here, as I say from chapter 1, verse 1, Paul is an apostle directly via the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody laid hands on him, nobody ordained him, nobody commissioned him, only Christ Jesus did so. Just a quick footnote also from verse 2. This reference to dearly beloved, it is found throughout the scripture, Old and New Testament, and regrettably there are people that claim to be born again that believe it is okay to be in same-sex unions, same-sex marriages. It is not. If you go to uh, Daniel, Scripture with Scripture, uh, Daniel chapter 10, you find the Lord speaking to his prophet via Gabriel. And if you look at verse 11, the word of God says, And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly Beloved, understand the words 
that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. Daniel, you are greatly beloved. This is a heavenly love. This is a sacred love. There is nothing suspicious about this love. Please go back to Second Timothy. But Paul, as I say, was an elder. He was older and he clearly had a spiritual love for Timothy. So like I say, nothing suspicious, nothing inappropriate. Simply Paul being a very loving and affectionate older brother, minister, and also an older apostle in the Lord. Paul was a spiritual figure. He was a father figure, obviously, but he was never called Father Paul or Reverend Paul. Only God is reverent. Verse 3, I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Verse 4, he was mindful of Timothy's tears. Timothy sounds like a very emotional man, and Paul was also an emotional man. In fact, in many ways, Paul mirrors the Lord Jesus, and Timothy also mirrors the Apostle John. Verse 3, he prays for Timothy night and day. What a magnificent piece of scripture. Paul was the greatest man that ever lived. He was the greatest apostle that ever lived. He wrote most of the New Testament, and here you have the greatest man that ever lived praying day and night for Timothy. This is intercession with a capital I, and we are all called to pray for one another, and we are all called to intercede for one another. We do not pray to dead people to then pray for us. We pray for one another while we are here on the earth, alive and kicking. We do not believe in praying to dead people. By verse 5, you have three generations of saved people. Lois, Eunice, and of course, Timothy. Back in verse 2, he said to Timothy that he was his beloved son. But unfortunately... Timothy's father was not saved. Back to Acts 16 again. So from verse 5, like I say, you have three saved people, grandmother, mother and son. God is in the business of saving families. Sometimes it takes 10, 20 or 30 years to have an entire family saved. If you're saved and your mother is not saved, continue to pray for her. If you're saved and your daughter or your son is not saved, continue to pray for them. Pray without ceasing. Another Pauline expression. But don't give up. Six, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. You have to help yourself. The Lord helps those who help themselves. Timothy quite possibly was also a carnal man. He may have been easily distracted. And here Paul says that you have to stir up the gift of God, which Paul gave him by the putting on of his hands. I believe that gift was teaching. I believe that Timothy was a teacher. In fact, most of this epistle concerns the word of God. By chapter 2, he is told to study to show himself approved unto God. By chapter 3, he is told of the Holy Scriptures, which had the power to save. So here, Paul is reaching out to his young disciple, who quite possibly had strayed, and here he is reaching out to his dearly beloved son, to pull him back in. Paul was a very loving man, and as I say one more time, Paul mirrors the Lord Jesus, and I also believe that Timothy mirrors the Apostle John. 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love 
and of a sound mind. Fear in and of itself is not a sin. The apostles were fearful after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They locked themselves away in the upper room and Jesus had to walk through walls to reach them. They were fearful, but they too had the power. They had the love and they should have all been experiencing a sound mind. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is the main problem that affects all saved people. Yes, sometimes you can have demonic oppression, but for the most part, you are dealing with the flesh. The flesh is our biggest enemy. So we should be able to say that we have the perfect peace, which passes all understanding, and we have a sound mind, which comes when we meditate on the scriptures, which comes when we separate ourselves from the world, which comes when we renew our minds. But again, we have to help ourselves. The Lord is not going to reach down every moment of every day and, as it were, tie our shoelaces for us. We have to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. 8. Be not thou, therefore, ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Okay, quite a bit from 8 through to 11. Don't be ashamed from verse 8 of the testimony of the Lord. The Jews considered a crucified Messiah to be a stumbling block, and to the Greeks it was foolishness. It was something to be laughed at. It was something to be scorned. First of all, Timothy is told to stir up the gift that is in him. Then he is told to lose the fear that he has retained. But here he is told not to be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. These things are possible for saved people to experience. And I have spoken out against Lordship salvation for as long as I've been saved. And a typical Lordship salvationist will look at somebody like Timothy and suggest that he either is not saved or he hasn't been chosen or he is in rank rebellion. But that's not the line that Paul takes. Paul is reaching out to his young disciple with great love and he's saying, please don't be ashamed of the testimony or of my afflictions. In fact, he calls himself a prisoner of the Lord. Paul was a very modest man, like I said from the opening comments. You won't find him being elevated to something that he was not. He lived and worked and died among the people. He goes on to say that Christ has saved us, past tense, by a holy calling, not according to our works. We were not saved by our good works. We are not kept saved by our good works. He has saved us in spite of ourselves, not because of ourselves. Our righteousness, our goodness, so-called, is filthiness in the eyes of the Lord. Every religion in the world teaches, if you do A, B, and C, you have a very good chance of being saved. They can't guarantee it, but they imply it. However, when you get to biblical Christianity, you find that he died for us. It is finished. He died for the sins of the world. And Paul says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Be ye reconciled unto the Lord. By ten, the Lord has abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We live and breathe because he lives and he ever lives to make intercession for us. Without him, we can do nothing. We will die without him. We cannot function 
without him. By verse 11, Paul calls himself a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. Paul was a very busy man. Paul did not write dissertations. Paul did not write encyclopedias. Paul did not write long books. Paul did not give long theological talks. He was always out and about his father's business. He was traveling around the Roman Empire. He made every day count. Are we all called to be like Paul? No. Most people won't come anywhere near the ministry that Paul had. Timothy didn't come anywhere near the ministry that Paul enjoyed. But Paul was busy. Paul set an example. And those of us that are born again look to how Paul lived, functioned and died. Every day he did something new for the Lord. And he's reaching out to Timothy and saying, follow me. I follow Christ, so you follow me. Not necessarily in quantity, but in quality. 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Two things to say here. First of all, boldness and maturity and confidence does come with time. Also, Paul makes it very clear that God saves you and he keeps you saved. It's down to the shepherd to save the sheep. If the sheep strays, the shepherd goes and finds the sheep and brings the sheep back into the fold. That is the job of the shepherd. But verse 6 says, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. You have to help yourself. Your salvation doesn't depend on you. But if you want a sound mind from seven, you have to be walking with the Lord. To avoid being ashamed, you have to be a doer of the word. And the more you grow in grace, you won't be ashamed of the Lord, but you will suffer all things for his name's sake. If you are born again, your life is never going to be a bed of roses. To be saved is very easy, but to be a disciple, to be victorious, to be a blessing to the brethren isn't easy. Is it possible? Yes, but it is not easy. 13. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul was the greatest teacher. He was the greatest mentor one could ever have. And yet even here, Timothy is struggling. Paul wasn't infallible. Paul had his flaws. Paul had his battles with the flesh. And here, one of his greatest disciples is also struggling. Again, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. God didn't call academics. He did not call the brains to be, or the brains that were. He chose ordinary people. In fact, he chose flawed people. Look at the sons of thunder. On one occasion, they wanted to call fire down from heaven to devour the unbelieving Samaritans. And Jesus had to rebuke them. Look at Peter. He was constantly making mistakes and misunderstanding the Lord's ministry. And on one occasion, Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. He's speaking directly to Peter. And yet behind Peter, a saved man, is Satan. If you're saved, you can be oppressed by the devil. Not possessed, but oppressed. But I also believe at the same time that our biggest enemy is the flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Was Timothy a lost cause? Absolutely not. Have you strayed from the Lord and now don't know what to do? Are you a lost cause? Absolutely not. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Confess your sins if you have strayed from him. If you're reading this and if you can relate to Timothy, you're in good company. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write Second Timothy concerning a saved man because many people are like Timothy. And here the antidote is found. Turn to the Lord, confess your sins, and by chapter 2, study to show yourself approved unto God. But more on that when I get to the second chapter. 14. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. That good thing, I believe, is in reference to his teaching from verse 6. But once again, Timothy, you have to stir it up. The Lord helps those who help themselves. That may sound like a cliche, but it is absolutely true. 15. This thou knowest, 
that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelius and Homogenes, by fifteen Phygelius and Homogenes have turned from the Apostle Paul. This man lived the life that most people could never live, and when the going got tough, most people turned and forsook him, much like the Lord Jesus, he experienced the same thing. Tragic, but it's true. It always costs something to be identified with the real thing. To be a carnal, shallow, backslidden Christian is easy, but to be a real disciple will always cost you something. 16. The Lord give mercy under the house of once a forest, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So he ends it on a good note. He ends it on the fact that this man stood with him. And when the day comes in reference to the judgment seat, he wants him to receive mercy. So 18 verses opens and commences the first chapter. And for me, the overall theme is to help yourself. Don't just be a hearer of the word but be a doer of the word. And when you do that, when you apply it, you will become bold, you will become stronger, you will become more mature, and you will have the perfect peace which passes all understanding. But it comes with time, and you have to help yourself. Okay, next up, chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if any man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboureth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Okay, the first seven verses, as always, is pretty rich. Verse 2, really, Paul says to go out and ordain elders, plural, not an elder singular, not a pastor singular, but elders plural. Every local New Testament assembly should be run by a group of men. And uh, obviously if you are in single figures, you won't need elders plural. You may need one elder, or possibly two. But a typical assembly of say two, three or four hundred members strong would need three or four elders and these men rotate the teaching responsibility to the congregation to the church but what they don't do is fall into the trap of the Nicolaitans which I've already mentioned verses 3 4 and 5 Paul uses the analogy of a soldier and of course a good soldier is always fit and healthy and ready to be sent into battle and uh, Paul wants to put Timothy on notice. Special forces normally are on 24 hours notice to be sent anywhere in the world at a moment's notice and here Paul wants Timothy to be on notice and he wants Timothy to ordain elders that are also prepared and able to be on notice as it were to be sent anywhere at a moment's notice but again he's really pushing the point home that Timothy needs to be prepared for a hard life Timothy was in ministry real ministry a typical evangelist today will go from church to church selling his books selling his DVDs promoting his ministry quote unquote but here Timothy was a real evangelist. He was a real teacher. He was a real thing. But like I've already said, 
he suffered from ailments, he suffered from the flesh, and quite possibly he was also suffering from external elements. And by seven, Paul says how he wishes the Lord to give him understanding in all things. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you know the entire counsel of God. You have to read the scripture, you have to study the scripture, and you have to apply the scripture. Eight, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound, the written word of God, and I'll get to that in the latter verses, but he says here that he suffers trouble as an evildoer. If you look at the so-called religious world, the world of Christendom, whether it is the Catholic system or the Anglican system or the Greek or Russian Orthodox system, for the most part, their leaders are very well received by the world leaders, by the world system. But here Paul suffered. And he suffered because A, he was saved, and B, he was the real deal. But if you look at the Vatican, if you look at Canterbury, if you look at Utah, or if you look at Brooklyn, you are seeing many impostors, which for the most part, like I say, are received by the world because A, they are no threat to the world, and B, they are not the real deal. But here Paul suffered, and he suffered like no one suffered. Isaiah 53 told us how the Lord himself would suffer. And Paul so many times mirrors the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet to this day people are still slandering him. They are still attempting to do a character assassination on him. And they are still trying to undermine his writings, his ministry. This man was a very humble chap. He came from nowhere really. He wasn't called by the Lord during his initial ministry, during his time on the earth. He came post the resurrection. And uh, I do believe that Paul and Paul alone turned the world upside down. 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He set the standard, like I've already said, follow me as I follow Christ. He lived the life that few others could live, but he showed it was possible to live a sanctified and a separated life. And he went through all of his afflictions for the sake of those that were saved in his lifetime and those that were going to be saved after his lifetime. 11. It is a faithful saying for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. This is an interesting piece of scripture, and uh, most people will look at this and suggest it is in reference to one salvation. Well, it's not. Look at 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Meaning, if we suffer post our salvation, if we crucify the old man, if we pick up our cross and follow him, we will not only be a soldier from verse 3, but we are going to reign with him. We are going to reign with him during a thousand year reign. This is in reference to the millennial reign, not your salvation. But look at 11. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Meaning, if we died to ourselves, if we were buried with him, if we were raised with him, we are going to live with him. That does refer, of course, to our salvation. And many times you will find verses in the New Testament where salvation is mentioned and then rewards are mentioned sometimes a full stop or here a colon can distinguish one event 
from another. So I want to read 11 and 12 and 13 one more time. And Paul says, it is a faithful saying. It is true. Or verily, verily, listen to me. For if we be dead with him, we that are saved, if we have been put to death and raised up with him, then we shall also live with him. Here and now, of course, we are living in the spiritual kingdom and we are waiting for his return and then we are going to reign with him in his physical kingdom. If we suffer as saved people here and now, we shall also reign with him when he comes back, of course. We can't reign with him here and now, spiritually, because he's not physically here. If we deny him, he also will deny us in the millennium. If we live after the flesh post our salvation, we can lose our millennial inheritance and he will deny us. But look at 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself, meaning our salvation. If we believe not, if we fall into unbelief, if we fall into sin or carnality or indifference or whatever, he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. Once he has received you unto himself, you are saved to the uttermost. Hebrews chapter 7. He cannot deny himself. So salvation, first of all, the millennium, secondly, and thirdly, if you fall into some kind of sin, some kind of indifference, he can't deny himself. You are still saved, but from verse 12, Unless you suffer with him, you won't reign with him. So if you want to be fully received at the judgment seat, if you want to get all the rewards that he wants you to have, and above all, if you want to reign with him, you have to suffer with him. You have to be a good soldier and be prepared for hardness from verse 3. 14 of these things put them in remembrance charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit but to the subverting of the hearers they plural who's he referring to go back to uh, 2 1 and 2 commit this to faithful men ordain faithful men Paul's talking about elders that are going to come after Timothy and this is going to feed into verse 15 which I'll get to shortly but even though Paul is writing to Timothy and vicariously elders that are going to come and teach and feed and look over the flock. We can still apply this to ourselves because we are all priests in the eyes of the Lord and we are all evangelists in the sight of the Lord. We don't all preach on the streets. We don't all get up in pulpits and preach to local congregations and we don't all do verse by verse teachings such as this but we are all priests unto the Lord therefore we have to be mindful of these things as well look at 15 study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth this has reference to every saved man we are all expected to know the scriptures we can't all have a academic or a scholarly understanding of the scriptures we don't all have the same gift of languages for example in fact most of us don't know any greek or hebrew or aramaic and if you come across people that are always quoting their lexicons and are doing so to offer themselves as being a cut above the rest, or attempting to correct the King James Bible, then I believe you are dealing with immature, and in many ways babes in Christ. Also this expression to rightly divide the word of truth is absolutely imperative. If you don't study the scriptures, how are you ever going to know the difference between law and grace? How are you ever going to understand that the Jewish apostolic sign gifts are not for those of us living today. They were for the early church. They were a witness via the Jewish apostles to the people of Israel and vicariously the Gentiles. Why? Well, because they wrote the New Testament. 
Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that the just shall live by faith. The greatest miracle, the greatest gift is regeneration. And once you are regenerated, you should be praying, you should be seeking the fruits of the Spirit. This is something that Timothy really could have benefited from understanding, knowing, and above all, applying it to himself. Not speaking in tongues, because tongues can be mimicked. Not laying on of hands, because most of the time you're just giving the impression of doing something which you are not doing, and you are also putting people into a false notion of expectation. And many people come to these churches sick, and they leave these churches sick. Call on the Lord, get yourself saved, get into the scriptures, study to show yourself approved unto God and then see what he does with you. He may heal you from your sickness or your ailment, but he may not do. But above all, study to show yourself approved unto God. Don't fall into the trap of the cults. Don't fall into the trap of the Catholics. Don't fall into the trap of the charismatics. Be in the scriptures and read it and divide it correctly. 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Whenever I look at this, I'm always tempted to suggest that this has application to speaking in tongues, babblings, gibberish. It isn't. It's really uh, in reference to people who are in error, people who are preaching another gospel, and really people who are busybodies, people who should know better. And uh, these are the people that are ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 17. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concern the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Reading 18, I think of the preachers, I think of those who go to Matthew 24 and Acts chapter 2 and suggest that all of these things have already occurred. And of course they are in error and people such as that and people like Harmenius and Philetus overthrow the faith of some. They damage the faith of the weak and that's why ministries such as ours are always trying to re-emphasize the basics of how a person gets saved and how they can know they are saved and how they are to be expected to be when the Lord returns, meaning they are expected to be holy, they are expected to be righteous, and they are expected to be on notice. 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. This pretty much goes back to my initial point from the early verses of chapter 2, that you have to help yourself. You have to know what it means to be separate. You have to know what it means to be a soldier of the Lord. And you and you alone have to depart from iniquity. Yes, the Lord knows those that are his, clearly found here from 19, but you have to help yourself. 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. This goes back to verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1 verse 6. I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God, which is in you by the putting on of my hands. If a man or woman purge themselves, they are fit for the master's use. If you are a saved man or a saved woman, 
and you are living in sin. He is not going to use you. In fact, you are going to be prepared for destruction. And you won't be entering the thousand year reign when you die. That much is absolutely clear from scripture. 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart, those that have sincerely called on the Lord, those that came to the Lord on his terms. This is what Paul is really going to be driving home. This is leading up to his final crescendo. Flee youthful lusts, follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with those that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Be identified with the real deal. Be identified with the real disciple. 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. For me, when I get to verse 23, I cannot help but think of all those that don't understand the Bible issue, that don't understand imputed righteousness, that don't understand that the sign gifts are not for today. And these people are constantly arguing and bickering and bringing up foolish questions because they are unlearned. They are foolish. And again, Paul says, avoid these people. In fact, he says in Romans 16, to mark those which cause divisions, contrary to what I have preached. You have to separate yourself also from those that come to you with another gospel. Galatians 1, 6-9 says, even if an angel comes to you preaching another gospel, even if it comes from heaven, even if it has the appearance of being heaven sent, separate, reject, because that messenger so-called from heaven is accursed. That messenger did not come from heaven. It could be Lewis, it could be Medjugorje, it could be Fatima, it could be Muhammad, it could be Joseph Smith, it could be Brigham Young, it could be Charles Taze Russell, it could be the late Reverend Moon. It could be absolutely anybody. If these people come to you with a message which is not substantiated from scripture, dismiss it, expose it, shun it, and walk away from it. But here, 23, is quite possibly and quite probably feeding back into verse 16 and 17. And finalizing really from verse 18 these people are preaching an incomplete message and he even names two of them from verse 17 if you come across false teaching and false teachers and false ministries you can identify those people paul does it here you can do it as well but i guess really 23 if i was to give you a quick cross-reference would be to Matthew chapter 7. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't spend all of your time trying to debate people or trying to show people the error of their ways. Preach the gospel and move on to somebody else. Leave those heretics, leave those imposters, leave those immature, carnal and lustful people to the Lord. Push on. That's what he's saying really in a nutshell. 24. And a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. God has already granted repentance to the Jews. Acts chapter 5. He has already granted repentance to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 11. He has already drawn all men unto himself. John chapter 12. He has convicted the world of sin. John 16. 
he was already in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians 5. So this is not in reference to God granting repentance to unsaved people. No, this is in reference to God granting repentance to those that are already saved, but have fallen snare of the devil from 26, like Simon Magnus from Acts chapter 8. That they, plural, may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him, Satan, at his will. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Once you allow apostasy and false teaching into your mists, it spreads like wildfire. Just look at the Church of England. Look at all the divisions. Look at what they are now allowing. Look at what they are teaching, as if somehow God condones of it. He does not. He hates it. They are in the snare of the devil. They have been taken captive by the devil. And this goes back also, one more time, to 23. Avoid unlearned and foolish questions. It's one thing to have a healthful debate or discussion with somebody who is saved or wanting to be saved and is struggling to get the basics down. That is something which we all do, those of us that have been saved for a few years. But it's something completely different when you are wasting precious time with those that don't want to be saved or those that are in a false system. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't spend more time than you have to. Because 25 says that God has to grant those people repentance. Until he grants those people repentance, you are wasting your time. By all means, share the gospel with them. By all means, give them a few verses. By all means, pray for them. Absolutely. But don't spend all of your time going back and forth. Don't waste your time debating with these people. And if you make videos, don't waste your time posting response videos to these people or going on forums and posting response comments to those people. They are in the clutches of the devil and until the Lord steps in and deals with these people, they are going to be outside, really, of his kingdom. Okay, 26 verses. Once again, a very full-on uh, chapter. And if you've never listened to one of my verse-by-verse -verse teachings before, you will hopefully realise now that I read a batch of verses, offer my thoughts as I go through it. I don't have any notes, uh, but I like to keep it very simple, easy for people to grasp, and above all, to follow along. And hopefully you've got your King James Bibles open, and you are following along, and uh, you are enjoying what you hear, and hopefully the Lord is blessing the message. Okay, that concludes the second chapter, and uh, next up I will be looking at chapter 3. Okay, just before I get to chapter 3... I need to just do a quick recap, really, in reference to verses 16, 17, and 18. And I shan't read them again, but I want to just say this very briefly, that from verse 18, Paul says that some of these people in the early church have had their faith overthrown. And you can have your faith overthrown in many different ways, and I'm thinking primarily in a temporary way. Uh, for example, you can tell a new Christian that unless they have spoken in tongues, or until they experience the second blessing, they haven't yet been born again. They are not truly born again. That's one way to overthrow someone's faith. A second way to overthrow someone's faith would be to undermine their confidence in the Bible. The Catholic Church do this all of the time, along with the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Catholic Church will tell you that they, and they alone, are the interpreters of Scripture, and they then turn around and give you their tradition, which, in their opinion, supersedes the scripture. The Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses are also guilty of this. If you are a new Christian, if you have yet to be grounded in the word of God, you could quite possibly have your faith temporarily overthrown. Another group you may come across would be those that hold to works on top of faith in order to be saved. And they may add baptism into the mix and they may say to you that unless you are baptized or unless you have works in your life you are not saved these groups can overthrow your faith and it's incredibly serious if you go to matthew's gospel the lord speaks about how he sees people who overthrow the faith 
of his people. Uh, he doesn't mince his words. Uh, Matthew 18, and I'll start in verse 3. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Don't try to analyse the Lord's sovereignty and how man has free will. Don't try to analyse how God created the universe or how he sustains the universe. Don't try to figure out how God wrote the Bible and yet men wrote the Bible. These teachings, these biblical facts are irreconcilable. You have to come to God as a child, mentally speaking, of course. Look at verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Approach the throne of grace as a child. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come to him on his terms. You know you are a sinner. If you've lied, you are a liar. If you have stolen, you are a thief. And if you have lusted after someone, you are an adulterer. If somebody lusted after your wife or your sister or your mother or your girlfriend, you'd be horrified. If somebody lied to you, you'd be offended. And if somebody stole from you, you'd be aggrieved. And in some cases, you would phone the police because it is a crime as well. Five, and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Look at verse 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. The Lord does not mince his words. He's saying, if you cause one of my people to stumble or to be offended, it's better for you to be dead. You may just as well be dead. That's what he's saying. Powerful stuff. All of your liberal churches, all of your apostate Christians will say that Jesus was a very meek and mild person. But here, he's quite clear. If you cause one of my people to be offended, it were better for you to be put into the sea and drowned. And here he refers to the Christian as a child. He sees us as children. And children, of course, are helpless as sheep are helpless. Children need to have parents to look over them and sheep need to have a shepherd to look over them. One more time from verse 6. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Paul told you that some people have had their faith overthrown. Jesus said it's better for such a party that is guilty of this, to be put to death. In other words, as far as the Lord is concerned, you may just as well be dead to me. And Paul also said from Galatians that he wished how these false teachers could be cut off for their heresy, for their demonic doctrines. Where does this heresy come from? Who is the initiator of demonic doctrines? According to Second Corinthians chapter 11, it is Satan himself. His angels come to you as ministers of light. They infiltrate the church and once they get a foot in the door, it's very difficult to repel it. Paul told you also from Galatians 1, 6-9, that even if an angel came to you from heaven, an archangel, the very highest form of angelic being, even if an angelic host came to you with another gospel, reject it, expose it, and then separate from it. But I go back to Second Timothy and I'll finish with verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Yes, he knows those that are his, of course. But here, Hymenius and Philetus have been named and shamed. These people taught from verse 18 how the resurrection had already been and gone, which, of course, is heresy. So just a quick and important footnote concerning these verses. Like I say, you can overthrow someone's faith, sometimes accidentally, but by and large Paul is addressing this issue from the standpoint that these people are intentionally doing this. And he names these people. He doesn't pull back, he doesn't shy away from dealing with these heretics. He names them and he of course condemns them. 
So be careful, be mindful. If you are a Bible teacher, be careful what you teach. Be careful how you articulate the gospel to people, especially new Christians. And if you are guilty of undermining someone's faith, whether it's in the book or in their salvation or in any area of their walk with the Lord, be very careful. And Matthew 18 is very clear how the Lord considers those that would overthrow or would offend or cause his children to stumble. Chapter 3 verse 1 This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heedy, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. This expression from verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, does give a clear impression, I believe, that this is in reference to so-called saved people. Perhaps this could be in reference to those that go to church, those that are very religious, those that do good works, perhaps those that are in the public eye. But the chapter started from verse 1, in the last days. Clearly a messianic expression leading up to the return of the Lord. And from verse 2, terms such as covetous, boasters, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, so on and so forth, very much applies to today. In fact, over the last 25 years, it is now possible for children to divorce their parents. Unheard of just a generation ago, and yet now it is very much possible, and it's happening all of the time. Three, without natural affection, pretty much refers to paedophilia, something which is also very much on the rise. Female teachers having sex with their students, not just male teachers, but female teachers. And I seem to be reading more and more of this depravity every day in the papers. Again, 40 years ago, pretty much unheard of. And now it's happening all of the time. And the latter part of verse 4, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Sport. The number one religion in the UK is sport. Religion and sport. Sport and religion are synonymous. Football, as we call it here, or soccer, as it's known in America, is huge. It is big business in the UK. A generation ago, people still went to church. People still had time for the Lord, they still had time for the scriptures, but with churches closing and quickly becoming carpet shops and kebab houses and with satellite television becoming more and more accessible and free view television and the internet and smartphones and iPhones, people are sport for choice. So they turn to the things of the world which are temporary and one day they will fall away. And scripture says if you love the world, you cannot love the Lord as well. And the latter part of verse 5 is pretty self-explanatory, but Paul says, from such turn away. Separation, once again. Yes, you have liberty in the Lord, but if you come across a party, or parties which are in error, or if they can be found from verses 2 down to 4, if you can spot these people, and here Paul's quite clear as to the sort of people to look out for, then you are to separate from them. Six, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Again, this is in reference to religious people. Yes, Paul is looking at the world in general and he's seeing this falling away, which first of all affects the church. And he's also looking at the wider community, the world, and how they are going to function up until the Lord's return. Much like it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, as it was in the days of Noah. Noah preached for 120 years, warning people to repent, and not one person repented. And the floods came and everybody drowned. Only Noah and his wife 
and his children and his daughter Noz were spared. One family out of what, 10 million people? On the day of Pentecost from Acts chapter 2, around 1 million people travelled from all over the Roman Empire to go up to Jerusalem and yet only 3,000 got saved. The road to destruction is broad and many there be which go in thereat and the entrance, the gate, the way into everlasting life is narrow and few there be which find it. But here Paul says that these people are ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What a devastating indictment. You can spend day and night speaking to somebody, but many times they are following along with you, but they are not listening to you. He that has eyes to see and ears to hear is very much related to this kind of thing. 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. If you are a born-again Christian, if you are standing against error, if you are standing against hostility, if you are standing against the ecumenical movement, you will have a barrage of hostility coming back at you. And here Paul says that Moses had to stand up to Janus and Jambres, a couple of Old Testament false teachers. Again, this whole theme, yes, Paul is looking into the future, but he's also looking at the church. These people are going to come from within the church. 9. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Their time is limited, the devil's time is limited, the Antichrist's time is limited. It may appear to those of us that are living in time that the bad guy and the people of the world are pretty much having it all their own way, but their time is limited. One day judgment will fall, and when it falls, it will fall very quickly and very hard. 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystria, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Paul practised what he preached, and he preached what he practised. This is very simplistic, and yet it has to be said, because it's all very good and proper to preach a hard message. It's all very noble to offer yourself as a Bible-believing Christian, and yet do you practice what you preach? If you don't, you are a hypocrite. But here, Paul says, you have known my doctrine and manner of life. Paul was a living epistle, and he said that you should be a living epistle, and I should be a living epistle. 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Underline that. If you are born again, you will suffer persecution without a doubt. I know a bus driver who had a recent run-in with his employers and he refused to drive a bus due to an advertisement that was on his bus and uh, he got some flack as a result of that. Although they swapped the drivers, he was able to take another bus out. Nevertheless, he suffered persecution for his faith. If you are born again, and if you work in an office, you will hear things, you will see things, you will be privy to things that you don't agree with. And if you choose to take a stand, you will suffer persecution. If you know somebody who says they are born again, and doesn't suffer persecution, and seems to have a rosy life, then you can be sure of one thing. Either that person is a secret service Christian, or they are not born again. They are simply playing church. But here Paul doesn't mince his words. He says you will suffer persecution if you are in Christ Jesus. It goes without saying. Like I said previously, to be saved is very easy. But to grow in grace, to receive a full reward at the judgment seat, to suffer with him will cost you something. But the reward that awaits you is immense. It is out of this world. 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. One of the things about deception is that those that are deceived don't know. 
they are deceived. And of course, as we get nearer to the end, things are going to get worse, not better. There will never be a revival that occurred back in the 18th and 19th century. That's not going to occur. We are living in the last days, and things are going to get worse, not better. 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy's mother was a Jew, and according to the Jewish Knesset today, that would have enabled him to be considered a Jew. And therefore he would have had the Old Testament, the Tanakh. And Paul says that since he was a child, he knew the scriptures, the holy scriptures, the word of God. Not the original autographs, they were long gone. Copies of copies of copies, and Paul says you had the holy scriptures as a child. Sola scriptura, scripture alone, and sola fide, faith alone. Paul wrote this epistle around 65, 66 AD, and Timothy is about 30, 35 years old, and he says, from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. You were saved by the Holy Scriptures. Not the original autographs written long ago. Moses wrote the first five books 1500 years BC. The last book of the Old Testament was written 400 years BC. And yet Paul says, you've had the Holy Scriptures. And we still have the Holy Scriptures to this day. 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture is God-breathed. It didn't come from man, it came from God. Yes, God chose a group of men to write his Bible. 41 authors living on three continents over 1600 years apart, but the scripture came from him. He inspired the writings. So we know when we hold the Bible, we have the word of God. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. And why did God give us the word of God? So that we would be perfect in doctrine, correction, and instruction in righteousness. That the man or woman of God would be perfect unto all good works. It goes back to the previous chapter, chapter 2, verse 15, to study, to show thyself approved unto God. This is the main theme of Second Timothy. Study, rightly divide. Why? Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it goes back once again to the opening chapter. Chapter 1, verse 6, to stir up the gift which is in you. The gift of teaching. To be able to know the word of God. To be able to know the will of God. And the more you grow in grace, the more you will suffer. And when you suffer, according to chapter 2, verse 12, you are going to reign with him. But here, Paul ends chapter 3, one more time, that the man of God may be perfect, meaning complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He is going to be completely equipped. He stands completely apart from organized religion. He does not need a priest or a pastor or a deacon or an elder or anyone for that matter to tell him what God thinks or says. He has it in the word of God. So 17 verses concludes the third chapter and once again, these chapters are loaded with doctrine, with prophecy, but above all, with practical living, practical application. Read the Word of God, study the Word of God, rightly divide the Word of God, stand for the Word of God, and once again, be a doer of the Word of God, not just a hearer of the Word of God. Chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I charge thee, I command you. Pretty clear, isn't it? And he ends verse 1 by saying that at the Lord's appearing and his kingdom, he is going to judge the quick and the dead. Not in reference to the rapture, but in reference to the second coming of the Lord. Verse 2, preach the word, 
in season and out of season simply means always be ready and prepared to preach the gospel whether it's convenient or not or even whether it's safe or not and also be prepared if necessary to expound on the scriptures to another saved party if necessary but above all be prepared like a police officer is never off duty so the same is true of a elder or a deacon or any christian for that matter we're never off duty and we should always have tracks on us i believe but above all the word of god should be in our hearts three for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables we have it today christian television so-called is littered with people that are screaming shouting dancing around to music if you wish to call it music to teaching if you wish to call it teaching these people are crazy these people are insane again just a generation ago such really wasn't even seen or heard or spoken about now it's endemic we have it everywhere in the uk one of the fastest growing religions outside of islam is the charismatic movement it is quadrupling year after year why will people want to be entertained i heard of a woman who joined a worship group so-called at a church somewhere in london and it turned out that she was a violinist she wasn't saved but she wanted to perform with other musicians and the only way she could do so was through this particular church again a generation ago or so it would have been impossible it would have been unheard of it would have been unthinkable to have unsaved people entering a typical church and performing singing and dancing what have you because the preaching would have been solid the preaching would have just penetrated the hearts of the unsaved and those that were in sin those that were out of fellowship with the lord would have been out of the door quick smart but now these churches stand for nothing now all they want to do is entertain and they want people to join their pews start tithing and make the pastor and his wife even wealthier and the lord detests that of course five but watch thou in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry timothy was a teacher he was a leader and like i've already said he was also an evangelist an evangelist in the new testament was somebody who was sent out by a typical local new testament style assembly and you would go out by faith and you would preach on the streets if necessary you would give out tracts you would get a sign and you would reach out to unsaved people and those people would come to you you would take them to your church and you would teach them the word of god that's pretty much what a first century evangelist was nowadays people travel all over the world going from church to church and selling their merchandise and they offer themselves as evangelists that's not what an evangelist is in the new testament that's very much what you would consider to be a slick salesman i believe anyway but here paul says make full use of the ministry which you have being again an evangelist he was a teacher he was a pastor or an elder but he was also an evangelist like paul he was a busy man he had lots of things going uh, he wasn't sitting around doing nothing he wasn't writing dissertations like many so-called scholars today do but he was out and about pound in the street as it were and also from verse 5 he has to endure afflictions if you've ever gone in the streets if you've ever preached if you've ever given out tracts if you've ever held a sign you know what that is like you will get a lot of flack you will get people shouting and screaming and uh, giving you the fingers and all that sort of stuff but that goes with the job really six for i am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand he knew that death was around the corner and the moment he died he would go straight to be with the lord absent from the body present with the lord no purgatory the moment he died straight to heaven he would go the moment you die straight to heaven you will go 
unless of course you are alive when the rapture comes in which case you will never die but here Paul is very much aware that death awaits him and he's ready for it which is even more important seven I have fought a good fight I have finished my course I have kept the faith henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day and not to me only but unto all them also that love his appearing he had a spiritual crown the moment he was born again he had a spiritual garment the moment he was born again Christ's imputed righteousness but when he dies he gets a physical crown which he gives back to the Lord he will throw his crown at the feet of the Lord and this isn't just for him it's for all of those that love his appearing nine do thy diligence to come shortly unto me for Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica Cretans to Galatia Titus unto Dalmatia Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world what a stinging indictment Paul name names and we've seen those from the previous chapters and he's going to name somebody else in a few verses time but he does this for a reason not to be spiteful but to warn others that are going to come throughout the church history he endured all things for the elect's sake we've already read that but he's also trying to warn people that even if you are saved you can still fall into the trap of apostasy indifference and you can fall away and going back to chapter 2 12 again you can also lose your millennial inheritance so be careful 11 only Luke is with me take mark and bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry and Theseus have I sent to Ephesus the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus when thou comest bring with thee and the books but especially the parchments this man is on the verge of death there's no bitterness here he's simply writing his last will he's simply looking back at where he's been and he's also looking into the future but what he really wants are the parchments this man was a writer he wrote 13 epistles and if you want to give him Hebrews you're welcome to in which case he wrote 14 epistles he also wants Luke to bring Mark with him John Mark of course and here Luke is Dr Luke who wrote Acts of the Apostles and the Gospel of Luke Luke was with Paul up until the end as was Timothy Timothy I believe mirrors John the Apostle who never forsook the Lord and Paul like the Lord died penniless completely forsaken in many ways but that's not what he's interested in what he wants is the parchments to be brought to him and he wants others to experience the peace which he is experiencing here 14 Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil the Lord reward him according to his works of whom be thou aware also for he hath greatly withstood our words Alexander the coppersmith whoever he was clearly had done Paul an injustice and Paul as I say on his deathbed is still looking out to his disciples be careful of him he says mark him out because he has done harm to me and quite possibly he's going to do harm to you because all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution Jesus said if they hated me they will hate you 16 at my first answer no man stood with me but all men forsook me I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge all the apostles but John forsook him Paul says here they've all forsaken me and yet he goes on to say that he hopes that God won't lay it to their charge he hopes that God won't judge them for that still thinking of other people like the Lord Jesus would have done of course 17 notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion the lion of course is Satan the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me that the preaching might be fully known again he's thinking of others he's about to die he knows he's saved there's no ambiguity as to where he's going to go and he's given God all the glory remarkable 
18, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, of whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. God will get you home. If you stray, he will come for you. But if you stray and don't repent, if you stray and remain in rebellion, you're on your own. Yes, you're still saved, I believe, but you have a duty to walk with him, to stay close to him, to guard your testimony. The Lord helps those who help themselves. Here he says that the Lord will preserve him unto his heavenly kingdom. Only God can do that. We cannot preserve ourselves. Only God can do that. In reference, of course, to our salvation. But our fellowship can be dependent on how we live post our salvation. 19. Salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of one Sephorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Melitium sick. Malta, of course. 21. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So that will conclude Second Timothy. And I hope I have pronounced these Greco-Roman names correctly. It's never an easy thing to do. But uh, the main theme, of course, of this video is to share the good bits with you to encourage you to grow in grace. Also from 19, you find Priscilla called Prisca, just an abbreviation, of course. And Priscilla and Aquila were a formidable husband and wife team in the New Testament. They weren't pastors but they were certainly equipped enough and able enough to reach out to Apollos and put him on the right track because he was preaching John the Baptism's message of repentance, i.e. the Lord's coming, get ready for his soon arrival, whereas, of course, he'd been and gone and John was dead. So therefore they were able to tweak his message and educate him more fully and more perfectly unto the full things of the counsel of God. Verse 20 is interesting. He says, Trophimus, have I left at Melitium sick? Trophimus wasn't healed by the Apostle Paul. Timothy wasn't healed from the previous epistle to him. Paul is at death's door. The sign gifts are ceasing because the apostles are dying. And therefore, we have the word of God to go to. Like I said earlier, it may be that the Lord heals you. It may be that he does not heal you. But here, Trophimus wasn't healed by the Apostle Paul. 21, he says, do thy diligence to get to me before winter. It's going to get colder. It's going to be harder to reach me. And 22, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. And that ends this verse by verse, unscripted video Bible study on 2 Timothy. And as always, I hope you have been reading along with me. And if you started with me, Lord willing, you have ended with me. And, uh, also, just before I sign it very briefly, it's interesting that Paul lists the Gentiles for salvation and not the Jews. He wept for his own people, the Jews, of course, but he wanted to reach out to the Gentiles because he was sent to the Gentiles. That was his ministry. He was the apostle to the Gentiles.